Welcome, welcome to real-time session, actually our second to last real-time session, and we've saved the best for the end. Um, on Thursday, we'll be talking with Mario Ostergaard, who's the director of the Aarhus uh, Public Library in um, Denmark, which is frankly one of the most innovative libraries, I think, in the world. Uh, and we're going to talk about libraries' movement and probably talk a little bit about libraries as they think of reopening. Uh, today, um, I want to say that we, we have another of, I think, the best li public libraries in the world represented, uh, and that's the Cuyahoga Public Library uh, in northern Ohio, in the suburbs of Cleveland. As an Ohio-born person, we grudgingly, I'm from Cincinnati, so we grudgingly accept that it's Ohio, but um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but we really, uh, to talk to some of the people that I, I think have truly mastered the, the, the necessity and, and the mechanisms of doing uh, advocacy uh, in times of crisis and in times of um, plenty, um, really both of those things. And it's it's being able to do both that's very important. So uh, I want to quickly uh, welcome Terry Feldman, who is the uh, former director of the Cuyahoga County County Library, also former ALA president. Uh, under her watch is where Libraries Transform campaign began, which I think is just an amazing and enduring campaign. Um, I've always hated the read posters because you can read anywhere, but tra Libraries Transform, I love it, is because it's the active uh, transformation that's in there. Uh, Haley Rich uh, is joining us. Um, Haley, what is your title these days? Uh, Communications and External Relations Director at Cuyahoga County Public Library. Very good. And Galen, I'm sorry, Galen, your last name. I, I'm sorry. Caroline, it's okay. I, I should have. I should have told you. Galen Sherline. Uh, and your your title? So I'm a partner in the law firm of Retzel and Andrus, and I'm also a director of our uh, consulting division, Retzel Consulting Solutions. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today uh, to talk a little bit about advocacy, to talk about how we gather and build support for the library and library issues. That's going to be an increasingly important topic as we're moving ahead. So, um, Sari, how are things going? So um, I'm sitting here in New York City in the epicenter. And uh, as I just said to you, reminded every day that I'm old. So uh, I, I will start by saying I've had this uh, long and uh, great career. And I want to thank you for letting uh, me do this and talk with my pals, Hallie and Galen, today. Um, I, I miss them a lot, so I'm happy to be with them and you, and you've known me through most of my career, so this is great. Um, I think libraries are about to transform again, and probably talking about advocacy will get us to talking about that transformation. I just want to uh, give a little context around what's happening in libraries, and I think um, the most, uh, you know, kind of the most remarkable thing right now for me is that 98% of libraries in the United States are closed to the public. And that's just a startling fact when we think about how libraries carry people through crisis. We think about Hurricane Katrina or you know, other really dramatic events in society. Libraries were up and running almost immediately or never closed. And um, this time, libraries will not be among the first responders to society. Um, because I've had this uh, kind of long career, I really saw libraries transforming from that point of being about transactions and really book circulation to being around what I call the intersection of information and experience. And I think back a lot to Robert Putnam's book about bowling alone. And I was talking to Hallie about this recently, that um, we started to try to imagine libraries as bridging social capital, about mixing people up in a social setting that was really healthy and was going to um, kind of inspire and restore society to be able to, um, to, you know, to be much more engaged in change and what was needed. And then recently we had Eric Kleinenberg's book, Palaces for the People. 
that said, you know, libraries, you're, you're doing a lot online and really great things are happening, but don't forget your physical space builds social capital. Again, it brings different people into a building to make change, and that's very, very important. Okay, so now we fast forward and buildings are shut down. I've been, you know, running around the country for years talking about how libraries invented the sharing economy. Well, what are we going to share? What are you going to be willing to touch that I've also touched in the future? You know, the digital collections are really important. But are people going to recognize that those digital collections come from libraries? That's a big question. Um, things are branded OverDrive or Libby or even the Kindle app, even though the digital content might come from libraries. And then circling back to this notion of building social capital, of being palaces, I mean, what kind of investment are libraries going to have to make in health and hygiene to bring people back into their buildings and to, all, to protect the safety of staff? I mean, we've been concerned about safety of staff for a long time, but now we're talking about a whole other level. So, you know, these have been really big questions for me. How do you build a bridge in a socially distanced society? And so uh, I, uh, people that I love to brainstorm with because they're so smart but also fun are Hallie Rich and Galen Sherline. And I'm going to let Hallie start by talking about what she does at the library, and Galen will chime in about the relationship she's had with Cuyahoga County Public Library. And then we'll get into the meat of this conversation. No. Hey, Hallie, take it away. All right. Thank you, Sari. And um, yeah, Sari and Galen are among my two favorite people to have fun with and to brainstorm with. And so my role at Cuyahoga County Public Library, um, as I mentioned, it's communications and external relations. So what in the world is that? Um, I'm responsible for marketing and for fund development for the organization, um, as well as, as government relations and kind of broadly stakeholder relations. So I really see my job as helping to define the library's story and figure out the right channels and the right messages to convey to people. Um, and of course, to make sure that what we're saying out here aligns with what we're doing over here. Um, and interestingly, uh, I will admit, I, um, I came to Cuyahoga County Public Library in 2012 um, for the opportunity to work with Sari. And um, before that, I, I was not from the library community. So libraries were uh, new to me as, um, as a, a profession, um, certainly not new to me as somebody who grew up using uh, her public library uh, frequently, <laughs> visiting very frequently. But as I, I got involved with, uh, with Cuyahoga and Sari's role within the ALA, um, Galen and I had the fun adventure of campaigning with Sari um, when she uh, stood for president. <laughs> and we went on an East Coast road trip tour, which has um, endless stories. Uh, so we'll have a beer sometime <laughs> and talk about those. Um, but as I got involved with the association and really began to understand things that were going on inside the library profession, I think thing that has really stood out to me and, um, and is relevant to our, our conversation here today around advocacy and communication is that the library community is very good at talking to each other. And we all understand really well the incredible value that libraries of all kinds provide to society. Um, where the library has struggled, and, and David, you mentioned, you know, the, um, not loving the read posters. There's like the nostalgia of seeing your favorite celebrities, I think, um, on some of them. But I think you're right. Libraries have not been totally effective at telling their story and, and recognizing um, externally and explicitly their value. And that's, you know, fundamental to advocacy. You have to be able to tell your story and have the right relationship so that that story can be heard. And so I think that's a huge opportunity and I've gotten involved with um, ALA, different advocacy uh, efforts and, and was fortunate enough to join the first cohort of the ALA Policy Corps where we're really 
um, um, I appreciate the association is focused on training professionals to be advocates and do that effective storytelling. Um, so I guess that's a little bit about me, and um, I'll turn it over to Galen, who is an expert in advocacy. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks, Hallie. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. If um, Sari Feldman calls me, I, the, the answer is always yes. So um, appreciate uh, being able to see you guys all here. Um, so I uh, have been a lawyer for about 23 years, but I've really primarily done advocacy and consulting work for about 15 years. And um, almost the entire time I've worked with Cuyahoga County Public Library, in one role or another. Um, starting it back in 06, we created a community um, at a, a group that would look at our facilities. We did a whole process that made a recommendation that ultimately led to a ballot initiative uh, in 2008, and, and that was successful. And then I've done their government relations and uh, helped with strategy for the last 11, 12 years. Um, so what I do uh, is I am very process oriented and I'm, uh, I really function where the public and private sector intersect and I try to make um, sure that my clients reach their goals by um, leading whatever the messaging is, figuring out partnerships, figuring out ways that we can um, reach our ultimate goal in, in the public domain. And so I think with libraries, um, the world is ever changing. We've lived through one economic downturn already, and I think that this recent uh, crisis is going to change libraries again in the future. Um, so my job, I, as I see it, is to stay ahead of the curve, always be looking for what's, what opportunity is coming next, what pitfalls we need to avoid, and how to position um, my clients for success, whatever that may mean. And I think we're in, uh, you know, it's it's... It's kind of cliche, but we are definitely in unprecedented times. Um, today in Ohio is our rescheduled election day. So um, it, it's all mail-in ballots. Um, so today I will just be sitting around waiting for 7.30 when I find out if my the issues that are on the ballot are successful or if there was a massive change in public sentiment with the uh, rescheduled election cycles. So it's a little bit of a crazy day for me among many crazy days. Um, so Galen, uh, you know, as you said, you've had a long history with the Cuyahoga County Public Library and its advocacy work, you know, I, dating back 15 years. We worked together. The fact that the library has been closed since mid-March, and as of this taping, libraries are still closed, with no evidence that they're going to be reopened in the very near future. Thinking about advocacy and voter support seems like a one-sided conversation. So as the library prepares to go to the ballot, and I know Cuyahoga County Public Library is, going, is planning to go to the ballot in November, um, you know, during this unprecedented time, what do you think stands out as some of the greatest barriers for garnering voter support? So, um, yeah, I, th I think that there, is, are, there are five barriers that I think uh, have to be addressed um, in this, I, I know, don't, I don't want to scare you, Hallie, sorry. Five? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll go through them quick. Um, the first is, is, is levy fatigue and economic fear, right? People don't know what's happening right now. They're afraid for their own bottom line, a lot of people unemployed, um, and when that happens, the thought of paying more in taxes um, scares people. And I should say that in Ohio, many of the libraries have local funding, so in addition to their state funding, they have local property tax issues um, that have to be passed at the local level, either for a certain period of time or there's new money that's available. Um, because of the way that the state law is written, you never collect more than the amount that you passed initially. So immediately after you start, after you pass an issue, the amount that you collect starts going down, which requires lots of places to have to go on the ballot, quite frankly, more often than I think happens in other states where they don't have this automatic reduction, if you will. Um, and so the, a local library levy in Cuyahoga County has to be within the context of um, 
there's there's other levies. There's health and human service levies. There's police levies. There's uh, you know uh, local income tax levies. Um, there's college levies. And so levy fatigue and economic fear, I think, are very real and things that you really have to look at. Um, uh, second is the the changing landscape and quite frankly health fears right Sari alluded to it how do you get people to want to go into your buildings again when they've been such a big part of the library story and if people are afraid to enter the building or they're afraid to touch materials how do you get those people back and make them feel like their health is not in jeopardy by visiting a branch or using the library services um third i think that in, in times like this in particular, but also just in the internet age and in the in the day and age of people having less ties to their local community because they're, they move around more, I think people are driven now by a more of a sense of self-interest than necessarily like a, a quote unquote greater good. Um, it used to be that people wanted to take care of their local communities because they had a lot of pride in their library or their school or whatever and I think that still exists to a certain extent but I think that it's in, in, particularly in, in scary times that is much less prevalent um, number four I think atrophy and delay is really a danger and what I mean by that is you know you have over half there's some statistic like half of the nation um, and probably higher in Cuyahoga County um, live paycheck to paycheck and so people being willing to say look i love the library but do it next year or do it some other point in the future so it's not that they want to vote no it's that they want you to do it later um and then and then fifth is connecting restarting that ability to connect with the customers that ultimately let's be honest become your voters so it's what i think a lot of our conversation is going to be about but it's how do you reconnect with people when your buildings are not open and what will the libraries look like when when they do in fact open again um because it's april it's almost may we're talking about an election in november that's really not a lot of time and quite frankly in uh november in a presidential year it's also very hard to get people's attention and i think we're going to talk about that a little bit more a little bit later could I so, just jump in really quickly? I, I, no. Just one, which is, it's a messaging question. Um, because, Sarah, you talked about now that libraries are closed. And this is something that I, I call it a personal uh, issue. When everything was physically closing down in those first couple of days and things were changing minute by minute, and time seemed to accelerate. Now, of course, we're in a point where time just seems gone. Um, <laughs> that messaging went out. Libraries are closed. We're closed. And in some cases, they were really closed. I was talking with a state librarian where they were saying they not only you know, locked the doors, they turned off the Wi-Fi, they shut off the utilities, and they went home. Um, and I'm wondering, though, that, that that message, it's been watching libraries try and re-narrate that, come back and say, our physical buildings are closed, but we're open, and we have materials, and we have services, and we're here to serve. And that's why I'm, you know, I, I'm just wondering how much that message do you think we need to think about? And particularly as we, we reopen the physical facilities, trying to do it in a less chaotic fashion, because particularly when we were closing physically, we didn't have much access to that message at all. I mean, it was governors and it was mayors and such. So um, I think Hallie's going to talk a little bit about that. And before she gets started, I just want to uh, point to people who might watch this that um, a library director in Idaho whose uh, name is um, who, John Phil has written uh, an article called Phased Reopening Plan for Libraries as COVID-19 Restrictions Are Lifted. And I, I want to say that we will be talking about this in the context of the buildings don't open, or it's gatherings of no more than 10, or gatherings of no more than 50, or no distancing limits. So across the nation, just like libraries are very local, so will the story of reopening be very local, depending on where you are. And I know that uh, I asked Hallie yesterday, Governor DeWine in Ohio did not specifically 
name libraries in his reopening plan. So at this point, it could be any of those four objectives for reopening libraries. Okay, Hallie. So um, talk a little bit about the what's changing now, what your message is. Your buildings are closed, but what's happening out there? Um, well, and you know, I think uh, from a messaging standpoint, it, David, your your observation that it, it was incredibly chaotic, um, sort of the closure communications. But one thing that um, we were very intentional about in our initial messaging was our buildings are closed, but we are not closed for business. And we wanted immediately to find what were some of the virtual things we could point people to. Um, there was an article literally the day that we made the decision to close or the next day um, it, it, across Cleveland that if you need Wi-Fi, you can get it in the library parking lot, um, which has been in one sense touted as this win that um, you know libraries are still offering Wi-Fi. Um, but when you think about the fact that within the first three weeks, so the, that first month of us being closed, we saw more than 7,000 logon sessions to our Wi-Fi across our 27 branches. That's, you know, 7,000 people or 7,000 cars pulling up and, and logging on. Um, it feels like, as the director of, of uh, Cincinnati Public Library uh, said this, it's, it's literally the least we can do. Um, and so I think there's major opportunity there. So I put a pin in that because I want to talk about that later. But from a messaging standpoint, we've been trying to think about from the get go, our buildings are closed, we're not closed for business. And going forward, Sarah, as you talked about kind of these phases of opening, um, what I'm really trying to stay cognizant of is that whatever phase we're in, and it will be a slow reopening, we're not going to, in a month, say, doors are open, everybody come on back, bring your stuff. Um, you know, we're probably going to be thinking about things like initially, potentially curbside pickup or very limited by appointment coming in and, um, and getting services or having set aside hours for vulnerable populations. As we're talking about those sort of incremental additions to the in-person or the physical service, um, you know, we will be maintaining and building the virtual. And I actually think that's something that all libraries are going to have to be thoughtful about for the long term. Um, Galen and I were talking uh, last week, or I don't know, time runs together, um, very recently. And, you know, even in the next three months, let's say bans on social distancing are, are, are lifted, or those requirements around social distancing are lifted, I don't think we're going to see the same populations racing back into our buildings. And so how do we shift our value proposition and both what the message is, but what we're fundamentally doing? Um, to meet the community's needs. And I, I, I think about those things in terms of after school support and education for students. Um, you know, you think about uh, internet connectivity and if the best we can offer is Wi-Fi in our parking lots while our buildings are closed, um, that does not bode well for the future of libraries. So I think these are, are broader issues that um, libraries very quickly in short order are gonna have to get clarity around what the longer term vision is and start to message that and be very clear about it and put our stake in the ground um, to say, here's where we're adding value in this, and, and our director hates this term, but I'm going to use it new normal because it, it is. Um, it, it's not going to be three months and we're kind of back to business as usual. Um, I And I, I hate to be so pessimistic, so I hope maybe that, I, I certainly hope that I'm proven wrong, but I think even once we have a vaccine, and we know in the next 12 to 18 months, I think people's habits are changing, and that's going to change the way they interact with libraries. And so we need to be planning for that now and talking about that now, getting out in front of that message. So and, can I just add one thing to, to, to what Hallie said? Is I think that what this is also showing is the haves and the have-nots, if you will, in terms of access to things like technology homework assistance, things, when all of these children moved to homeschooling, um, a lot of the decisions were made as if uh, everybody had access to a, a device and to the internet. Mm -hmm. And what we found was there's lots of places that the kids don't have 
access to the internet. And so Cuyahoga County Public Library has actually been pretty nimble um, in trying to find some solutions to help get kids online. And I know that there's other libraries that have started renting or, or, or loaning out um, hotspots or tablets or ways to get these kids back online because that's how to show your relevance um, because these kids, the thought of these children who, you know, they've now canceled school for the rest of the year, there are children, and I've heard some statistics in some districts that 25% of the kids have not even reported in digitally. So I think the libraries have to be thinking about how to support those schools and the children because we're going to end up in August if schools are reopened with a group of children that have not had access to information and they're going to need to catch up. And all of the programs that the libraries have been doing with homework assistance or, or whatever else to help the kids, if, if those aren't available, these kids are going to fall further and further behind. Um, not to mention that the library also has uh, run food programs in the summer for these kids. So these are very real <clears throat> and immediate needs uh, that I think the library has to be a part of, but it's, this situation's made it much more challenging. Hey, sorry, sorry. One, one, I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, David. Just real quick, and I promise this won't, because no, I knew okay. you had this all thought through, but uh, just, no, it, it struck no, me no, when we no. talk about the new normal. The new normal is almost always presented as a negative frame, as in what we will have lost. The, the new normal is, oh, people won't, won't, right? It's always a negative, that they won't do this, they won't be this, they won't do this. And, I'm, and, and I really love the idea of framing the new normal as a better normal, right? So that we can reset and talk about digital divide issues. The new normal better include the idea of universal connectivity. The new normal better include better um, connections to education and where 25 kids can't disappear. The new normal better, right? And so anyway, sorry, just something that I'm taking away right from that. I mean, that's the only thing you know, that brings me some sense of hope is that clearly some kind of um, really aggressive plan for connecting people has got to happen. It's, it has to become a utility. But, um, you know, Hallie, you just did a really successful library giving day um, that demonstrated the kind of loyalty that people have for libraries. And I was wondering if, um, so this is not one of the planned questions, but I was wondering if both of you, uh, uh, Hallie and then Galen, can talk about how you build on that library loyalty, how you hold on to what is a very tangible um, impact that libraries have on people's lives. So Hallie, if you want to start and say something about that. Yeah. Um, no, we did. We did a, an online day of giving um, in coordination with National Library Giving Day, um, which just started last year. So it was our second time around. We raised almost thirty thousand dollars in one day through online donations. And um, I don't have the the latest breakdown of numbers, but as things were trending that day, it was about a third of the donors um, were entirely new donors to the library. And these are you know people we've connected with um, and have made requests of in the past but for for whatever reason during this time of crisis um they really did come out and i think you know we know that we have incredibly strong support in our community um with with galen's help we did polling a few months ago and what that polling showed us was that we have incredibly strong support and that um that thinking about the levy campaign this year um i think i need phrase it this way and it just makes sense to me like it's ours to lose which is um, um, a negative and I need to get back into uh, uh, thinking more appreciatively um, but uh, but what what my takeaway from that is we have strong support of the community how do we maintain it and again it goes back to what are we going to do as an organization to shift and to be proactive in this new normal and David I like your point and it is again a better way of thinking of things people are going to use us differently and their people's needs are changing. So how are we going to adapt in a way that will be meaningful and relevant for our community? Um, and a couple of things from the polling that, uh, that stand out to me in terms of messaging that, that most resonates with our community, it was the library as a safe place for kids 
after school to get help with their homework. Okay, well in this new environment where we might not be able to have kids coming to the library in the droves that they did um, previously, how do we supply that safe, um, learning, interesting, engaging environment? What could that look like? Um, the other message that holds really strongly is maintaining evening and weekend hours for families and residents that need the access. So that tells me that's our community thinking about um, those who have, are, are job seekers, um, who need the library for education and for access. Well, we know with unemployment numbers at, at the scariest levels we've seen in a lifetime, uh, people are going to need that access. So again, if it's, if it's not our buildings, or if it is our buildings, but in some limited fashion, um, oh, and I see a sweet dog behind Galen that has just joined our call. Uh, <laughs> but if it is people, um, you know, again, how do we shift to be that access point? And then, uh, you know, fundamentally, internet connectivity, I think, is going to be the thing that libraries need to lead with and the thing where libraries really need to be active and advocating. And from a future long-term advocacy perspective, we, we have to be fighting for that because um, as we have seen, it's it's so essential. So, so yeah. I, I just want to add that um, when you have people that are donating and you have new people that are donating, it's a really positive thing. What the library has to do is maintain contact with those people because I believe that if you've had if you've gone in the library enough to give, even if it's a dollar, five dollars, whatever it is, you're now invested in the future and the success of that institution. So if we can stay in touch with those people and hopefully they're registered to vote, um, just reinforcing all of the positive messages about the library because there still are a lot of positive messages that makes that can turn those donors into supporters when it comes time at the ballot box. So um, figuring out a way to leverage your card holders, your the people that are um, giving, supporting, um, whatever, it, it ultimately in terms of your campaign is really critical because as Tally said, I mean, some institutions don't have a natural constituency. Um, they don't have abilities to connect with large groups of people. Libraries, however, do have the ability to educate and, and share messaging directly with their customers and hopefully supporters. Um, so I'm, I, I hadn't heard that number, Hallie, but um, congratulations and I'm glad. Hopefully it's like a lot of little donations and people that we can tap in the future. <laughs> it is. So, so in 2008, which is the last of the four levies that I was involved in in my career, um, we went to the ballot during the downturn in the economy in Cuyahoga County and were very successful. It was a lot of shoe leather. We went door <laughs> to door. I have strong memories of that, as I'm sure Director Tracy Strobel would reiterate. Um, we were pushing the stroller going door to door. Um, but uh, so what is a post-pandemic campaign going to look like, Galen? What's the strategy here? Yeah, so um, not only is it a post-pandemic, but it's also presidential, right? So um, I think that uh, the biggest issue is noise, right? People who you just can't get traction. People are worried about their health. Um, and so we have to figure out a way, I think, to be hyper grassroots and build a localized network of supporters, um, community by community. And so, you know, you serve 47 communities, got 27 branches, and we are just going to take it to the streets again, as we did before. I think we have to count all of our votes. We have to vote our ID people and talk to people directly. Um, it's a daunting task for the number of voters that we have to reach. But I think there's no other way in this atmosphere unless you have a $5 million campaign budget. Because to me, local levies uh, are not only about the message and the volunteer base, but it's also, there's a, there's a very practical issue, which is having the money to get your message out there. 
And in a presidential general election, what happens is super PACs can preempt your, um, not only is media very expensive, but super PACs can preempt your time. So you really have to be looking at different ways to connect with your um, supporters. And it, it's just got to be very grassroots. It's got to be very volunteer driven, and it's going to take a lot of work. Um, but that being said, I think it can be successful. Um, but, you know, we don't, there's a lot of unknowns right now, right? We don't know if there's going to be another spike in COVID. We don't know if there's going to be in-person voting or if it's only going to be um, by mail, which would be a first in Ohio. Um, Cuyahoga County does have a pretty strong history of a lot of um, vote by mail, so I think we're more used to it. But it's a different strategy, and it's also um, an expensive strategy because you have to chase all these individual voters with with a stamp. So um, I think that you know we're going to have to start early. We're going to have to be very focused on our message, very disciplined, and we're going to have to go community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and take nothing for granted. Um, and then the last thing I want to say about the presidential general is you also have a lot of people who will come in. And it's the strangest phenomenon. They vote just for the president. They vote, don't vote for anything else. So, um, you know, you can see a drop off of 20% depending on the ballot placement. And it's, it's, I don't understand it. I mean, I think if you're voting, you may as well vote down the ballot. But it's, it, it happens. It's a phenomenon. And um, so we have to make sure people find and vote on our issue. Hallie, what do you think? Um. <laughs> Jalen said it. She sounded it when she said it's daunting. <laughs> um, the street, you know, I, nobody's going to let you in their house, or you know, people right. can only ten at a meeting, so you're not getting in. So how do you take to the streets? You know, I think we are going to have to leverage our strong supporters, the relationships that we have, our donors, our foundation, our friends groups. Thinking about those people that. Um, you know, at the beginning of this session, David, you mentioned, uh, you know, advocacy in the tough times, but it's really the work that we've been doing in the good times um, and the relationship building that we've established, that we've done, that will get us through these tough times. And so leaning on the folks who are closest to us and figuring out a plan for, um, again, converting some of the in-person stuff virtual. Um, we were talking the other day with members of our foundation board who are strong supporters of the library and, and keep asking, what, what can we do? How can we help? Um, you know, one of the things that we were planning was to kind of put together this kit for the, over the summer for people to host house parties. Well, people aren't doing that. So how do we help folks set up a Zoom session with a few of their closest friends and have us come in and deliver our message? Um, Surely there are, uh, you know, organizations that are doing lunch and learns to keep their employees engaged while they're not physically in the office. How can we be part of some of those? Um, so it's thinking about some of those physical tactics that we, we would typically employ, but um, are there virtual components to them? Um, and I think, too, uh, and Galen, you mentioned this, you know, the various partnerships that we have established previously um, but also opportunities, thinking about shifting needs in the community. What are new partnership opportunities? And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned before having a seat at the table when it comes to important issues like broadband. Um, in Ohio, we know, and, and I don't think this is actually unique now across the country, but workforce is a huge issue and a place where libraries have an important role to play and make a tremendous impact. How do we ensure that we have a voice at the table? I think it's proving out our impact through various partnerships. Over the past three years at Cuyahoga County Public Library, we have been building partnership with county government, with um, the local workforce board, to be that connection point for job seekers, helping to connect them to the workforce board, helping connect them to our, our career counselors. How can we continue to demonstrate important impact there so it contributes to the story that we're telling? Um, and before we got started, you know, one of the things that just strikes me as, as a, an op again, opportunity that, that people can't ignore us, David and I were talking, and, and he said, you know, I, I think libraries have to be involved in contact tracing. I was like, that was in my notes. Um, I, I, I think that's a huge opportunity.
opportunity for library staff potentially that are looking at a different kind of workload. How can we be helpful? How can we participate in that? How can we help to collect and manage the data, which libraries are very good at doing, um, so that the community can access it and that we have some real-time knowledge of what's going on? I think there's a role there for libraries. So in this you know, for us, election year, where we're faced with a crisis where it's loud and noisy and people maybe aren't necessarily thinking about the public library, how do we over and over again demonstrate, prove out our value? Um, I think the term is be so good they can't ignore you. Um, that that has to be part of our campaign strategy that, um, you know, we have to uh, walk the talk. And so our message um, has to be a great one. That means we have to be doing great and important things. And, so, and, I want, and I want to add that I think it cannot be, this cannot be about status quo, right? If you, it's about status quo, you lose every time. Because like I said, people will kick the can down the road and say, just deal with it later. So I've, I think we have to position a choice. Here's what your library is going to look like with an issue. Here's what the library is going to look like without it. And if you position it as the status quo is going away, so we're either going to move forward or move backward. It's a different conversation, and it it helps to motivate people to act and to support. So, um, Helen, you started to go there when you talked about contact tracing, um, but um, you know the state has already identified that there will be budget cuts for libraries. I mean, it's inevitable. There'll be less taxes and. Um, they have rising expenses and rising unemployment. And we also know that um, for some legislators, it's the last person in the room or the loudest voice that gets the money. Um, libraries haven't always been that successful or that impactful in building loyalty and um, you know, among stakeholders such as legislators. So Galen, we'll start with you. How do we get um, Columbus to listen to libraries. Well, it, I mean, as we know from the exercise um, about a decade ago now, um, libraries have the ability to um, motivate their uh, customers to act to help us support our message at the state level. So that's the first thing. And then I think that um, we have a large group of people, and let's be honest, legislators look at those people as voters um, and supporters and because people have to be elected they listen to numbers um, numbers of people a lot of times so I think that it's important that the library community be organized and have a unified message at the state level um, and then be very strategic about the way that they're contacting people it's not enough to only contact your legislator you need to know who's in charge of the committees that affect libraries, you have to know who's in charge of finance, who's in leadership, and you have to have a very unified effort to reach those people to get their attention because you're absolutely right. You know, sometimes organizations with a um, strong public mission think that it's enough to be affecting um, public change, but every organization and every public entity has has a public mission that's going to be contacting the, the, the government right now and cuts are going to have to be made. So the schools are going to be advocating to not, to be really to be cut less. Um, local governments are going to be advocating to get cut less. Police and fire, all of these places. So libraries have to stand out and they have to advocate not only to not be cut as much, but also to reiterate the public good that they're doing to help those people that are unemployed, to help the children that need to be educated from home right now. Um, so it's a, it's a mix of reaching the right person in, in mass, quite frankly, you, because there's strength in numbers. It's just, that's just what political folks often look at. Um, and then it's being organized in a, in a very meaningful way so that if you have a thousand contacts. You don't. You don't want that to be fifty over twenty days, right? A thousand contacts. You want it to all be at the same time to get their attention. Um, and then I think you know, writing things. Um, you know, emails are one thing, and lots of people do change.org petitions and things. 
But I think that a personal phone call, a personal letter, um, and, you know, normally I would say showing up, but, you know, I'm not going to really say that at, at this point. Um, but really reaching out in a personal way that doesn't seem like it was some service that was sported around is really impactful. And then I think the ask is really important as well because um, you can't go to the legislature right now and say, hey, we need more money. It's not. It's just not realistic in this environment. So you have to really say, look, cut us 2% instead of 10%. Um, and that's the best way that, that I think that you can get their attention at the state level. Hallie? You want to add anything? I mean, I concur with with all that Galen uh, said, and it's. Um, I think again, it's it's identifying the priorities for the administration and the legislature, and then finding where the library aligns with those priority priorities, and really amplifying our message around them. So it's going to be workforce. We know that. What are we doing today, and what can we do into the future to demonstrate our value? and to, to make the case for our cut shouldn't be as significant as, as somebody else's. Um, you know, it, when it comes to internet connectivity, what have we been doing today? What can we do tomorrow? That's gonna be a priority. And I think certainly uh, it's an opportunity from a public-private perspective. You know, can we engage with AT&T and Verizon and Sprint and the, the different providers um, because I don't think they want internet as a utility. Um, so is there something that they can do in the short term? It's very clear that there is a need and a, and a, a gap. Um, how can we engage with them to give them an opportunity for a solution um, that addresses some of the broader problems? So for me, I think it is identifying the priorities at the state level and then demonstrating through a strong message, through those important relationships, um, you know, I, I, Sari, you were a master at this of, of recognizing the value of building those relationships. Again, so it's not us reaching out in a time of crisis when they haven't heard from you in years. You, you have the cell phone numbers of, of all of our key electeds and had the relationship where you could shoot a text. And um, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to trivialize it in that way, but like that level of connection is really important because they trusted you, you had their ear, and when you said, okay, this is something that's really important, we need to talk about it, we need to, they, they would listen. So I, I also think it just goes back to that like very basic of making sure that we have important relationships um, and that we're not just reaching out when it's a crisis and we need help. So, um, it, but one of the things Galen taught me was get their cell phone number because if you can text <laughs> them, they will look at that. <laughs> I, I, I always joke that before I got into consulting, I was very shy and now I'm fairly pushy. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, these, you know, you have to get people's attention because they're hearing from everybody all the time. Um, and, and you have to you have to look at their self interest. A lot of times, people who advocate to, at, at any level of government think that it's enough to be good. Um, it's not. They're hearing from people all the time, and so you have to have something behind you, and you have to have that relationship before you need something. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, in in non election times and pre pandemic, I've advocated to have your legislators out to your branches, right? See what's going on. Look at the programming. That's much more difficult to do now. Um, but I think providing legislators information about all that the library is doing now is important because we know that in Ohio, they're going to look at a budget correction in June. So we have about a month before it's being announced to really share information when other people aren't. Once the cuts are potentially announced, Everybody's going to be advocating. Every lobbyist is going to be out there, and and um, so you want people's attention when it's not a massive crisis. Obviously, the pandemic has changed a lot of that because everything is going to be a crisis. And quite frankly, going into November, everything is going to be a crisis. I mean, this is we're in for some rough waters here. Um, uh, on the on the election front, what I want to 
make clear though is we have to make sure people have access to vote, whatever that looks like, because I'm very concerned that as people are less, uh, you know, they're, they're more fearful, um, or maybe they don't like what we ran into in this election is sometimes people are stuck at home. They don't have a stamp. I mean, we have to make sure that people have access to the ballot, um, whatever that might look like. And I think that's a changing um, reality because, you know, for example, do you does the Board of Elections pay for your postage to return your ballot? They never did before. Maybe now they will. I don't know. That's a state issue. Um, you they didn't. Only in presidential elections did they send out an absentee ballot request form to every voter. Other years they didn't. You know, you have to know some of those logistics, right? And so um, when talking about state advocacy, there are some things that maybe we could advocate for that would help the library that aren't directly money. Um, things like access or being, you know, a, a center where you can get absentee ballot forms or, you know, things like that. Um, but, you know, the state. In Ohio, we have term limits, and so you have people that um, at times maybe don't have the institutional knowledge or, or recollection of history, um, and you have people that sometimes if they're term limited out, they're quite frankly looking for a job instead of looking at the greater good again, right? So um, not, not to say term limits are all bad all the time, but it's just a reality that we have to be advocating and educating all the time because of such uh, turnover at the state house. So, um, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, Sari, to talk about what you did uh, when they cut the local government fund back in the Strickland administration, real quickly, very quickly. Oh, I'll just say that when when uh, Governor Strickland uh, just in an eleventh hour budget decision, so just as the budget was finalizing, went after libraries. Um, libraries in Ohio were outraged, and we organized so quickly, and we got the message out to friends groups and the general public, and they shut down the telephone system and the email at the State House. They came after him in such numbers. Now we didn't get it all pulled back, but um, and there is uh, there are people who believe that that was the negative turning point for Democrats in the state of Ohio because um, he was a Democratic governor who went after libraries, and it was a Republican save in Ohio. And let us not forget. Library users are voters, so that's where we do have a leg up, and legislators recognize that. And Republicans remained loyal to libraries, where Democrats, um, although they were not opposed to libraries, did not come forward with strong support against the governor. So it was a turning point for Ohio. So I, I wanted to ask, um, so uh, Galen, you talked about voter fatigue of voting for levies. I have social media fatigue. I'm a donor to many causes, and they're killing me right now in email and in my Instagram account, where all I want to do is look at pictures of dogs, not cats for me. But you know, <laughs> I'm really not interested in tragic messages in my Instagram account. Or um, I never go to Facebook right now because it's, you know, again, it's killing me. So how do we use social media for messaging and um, in a very focused and deliberate way that people will not get fatigued by the library message? Yeah, so so I think that it, timing is important, right? Um, you can't be sending out a message every single day for the next six months because people will just hide you or, or ignore you. So I think um, sharing information, but but honestly, using our customers and our connections to personalize a message so that it isn't just sharing a meme or sharing, you know, forwarding a message or copying something, but have at the right time having a heartfelt message directed at certain numbers of people. Like when I do a campaign, 
I like to have people adopt voters, if you will. So um, you can do this all online and you can say, okay, I'm going to take these 20 voters and I'm going to make sure that they understand that this is an important issue to me and here's the message that I want you to, to hear about. Um, and so I think that person to person, peer to peer contact is much more effective um, than an organizational message because think about the way you consume your, your social media. Like you said, you're tired of it. I mean, I'm tired of the emails. I'm tired of constant contact. Um, you know, my, my law firm was putting out notices every day from about the coronavirus and the feedback that we got was every law firm is putting out the same thing and people are inundated. And so we actually stopped um, or, or cut back significantly because you have to listen to that. Um, so I think being targeted, being disciplined about being scheduled, and then ultimately when we need the votes and it's at the right time, using that friend-to-friend, peer-to-peer um, networking and third-party validation, as I, I like to call it, so, um, so that it's not just, here's a, oh God, here's another message from the library. Instead, it's Hallie to Galen instead of CCPL to Galen. Um, and, and, and then I think that there's got to be some advertising that can be done on social media based on interests and things like that. But I, I think people are fatigued. They're going to start turning things off. And, and presidential uh, elections, it's going to get worse. Um, so I think it's got to be that personal contact. And it could be a text. It could be social media. It could be, you know, God forbid, a phone call, um, but it's got to be personal. Hallie, anything you want to add as we're wrapping up here, Dave, David, yeah. do you want to ask anything or add anything? Well, I want to take while we have a couple of minutes to, to flip it on you. So what do you see? Um, as as uh, I'll selfishly use this time, what would be your advice to a library like Cuyahoga County Public Library in this crisis period, in a levy year? What do we need to be doing, and what message do you think we need to be getting out there? You're asking David? I hope no. I'm no. asking you. <laughs> I'm asking both of you. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, I have this dream that, um, that libraries and I, you know, I've been pushing the American Library Association will really make the push for universal broadband. I think that is a, an essential. There, there is no more important thing right now. I think for our national association to be involved in. And then going along with that, I think that the value proposition and Hallie and Galen help to craft this in the Libraries Transform campaign, that yes, we are, we believe in public libraries and the value of public libraries, but it's all libraries. So this is a time for us to really get behind school librarians, like we need to restore school librarians. If nothing else, it has shown us, no one's out, no one's curating collections for these four kids in schools, and now they're gonna be drowning in eBooks it's going to be vendor driven if we don't have librarians and that's ultimately not a good thing. So let's get behind the value of our profession. Let's remind people like there's a set of skills. That was one of the things that I did really like in your piece, David, that there's a set of skills that we have that other people don't have. Let's bring them to the forefront. You know, when it is about information, let's restore um, that value. Um, not talk about fake news, not pick up on other people's taglines, but just talk about the curation of information and education and reading material. Let's get back to that because that's our expertise. So, uh, you know, in my best moments, a sunny day in New York, feeling good, knowing I can get outside, hanging out with my friends this morning. Um, I, I am very proud to be a librarian. And Hallie, a hopeful moment from you as we close up here? A hopeful moment? I do, I, I think, um, going back to the Libraries Transform campaign and this idea, um, I, I am uh, 
continually amazed at the ways that libraries and library professionals adapt. And so I think um, as scary as, as, as the uncertainty is right now, um, I have faith that the library community will figure it out and chart a way forward. And Galen? Um, I, I will say that I think that people cannot imagine a world without libraries. And that's a really strong position to start with. Uh, as uh, you're advocating for your own local library. And I think that libraries have been able to adapt over time, and I'm quite certain that they will adapt in this new, uh, the new normal. Sorry, sorry, Tracy. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm hopeful that um, as we get sort of back to basics, back to spending more time with our families and simplifying our lives, that libraries provide a lot of what, um, our families and our and our lives need. So I'm hopeful for the future. And David, I'll give you the last word. Thank you. Um, I, I've now decided that we're going to take back the phrase the new normal. So I'm going to call this the new normal agenda. Um, <laughs> and, and that is, I think that if libraries continue to try and chase their value, that is, well, let's figure out what people need and then we'll become that and that'll be our value eventually we, we lose our base, our core, and our trustworthiness. So I think we need to be proactive in saying this is our essential value. It has always been our essential value, and it's even more important in these times. And the, the, the new normal agenda for libraries that I look at, in other words, how do we establish the new normal in a positive sense, universal broadband, uh, workforce uh, preparation, development, and, and enhancement, the idea of being a vital service in times of crisis, and right now that means contact tracing, which is more than surveillance, but is about support and information and taking care of people. Uh, and then last one, and I want to add this, and Galen, thank you. To me, to me, this is really important. We talk a lot about being about democracy and democratic access, access to vote. I mean, to me, that is not just access to the issues and information, but access to vote. Real quickly, um, I've been impressed that before the pandemic, there were larger studies going across the EU talking about as governments push more and more to digital services, um, there was a more and more need for the physical presence. But I would call that more of a community global presence. Once again, it doesn't have to be in a mm -hmm. building, but it does have to be that coming together and bringing that in. But they actually have legislation, the national legislation that creates libraries, and in the in um, Finland and in Denmark and in Norway, that includes a mandate to further democratic debate and conversation. It's built into their mandate to house political conversation, to house debates and such. And while we've taken that mantle up in the US, I think we now need to put a reality to it and acknowledge that it's a political discussion, but access to vote, access to issues, access to the ballot should be part of what we're doing. So I, I take from this conversation the positives that we have such brilliant people in this field, but that we have values that we're not having to create, but that we really can talk about what the new normal should look like and shape it based on a foundation and a history that we've been moving forward. So I appreciate so much this conversation and so much your expertise and uh, I, I learned moving to the south up in the north you always say I appreciate it and I appreciate it down here we say we appreciate you so I appreciate you um, <laughs> and all the work that you do uh, thank you very 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 much thanks everyone this was fun thank you thanks. everyone thank you. Very fun.